went through some of the new challenges, I think, that are addressed by open source. Um, and of course, we have to start uh, with the basics. Um, we, we've, this has, hasn't really changed. We've had a fundamental belief that you get better software with open source. Um, there's more eyes on the code. That contributes back to the community. Uh, there, you get lots of stakeholders. This highly distributed, very transparent uh, model, I think, has proven to uh, produce the best code. And if you look at how enterprises and, and everybody, uh, from students uh, through uh, software vendors, are developing, so much of it is, is uh, informed by the open source collaboration tools. You know, Git, uh, for instance, changed the way that you collaborate around code bases in a more decentralized way, and of course, enterprises have adopted that. I think it's, it's when you think about it, it's pretty obvious how op the way you develop open source has changed the way uh, software development works, and I think we're really proud of that, those of us who have been working in the open source industry. Uh, you know, the other, other aspect that we take advantage of a lot is you don't, it reduces uh, redundant development. You don't have to write a component if somebody else has already done one, and actually a bunch of people have done them, a bunch of people have used them, the best ones have emerged, the community has coalesced around it. You can really trust that the solutions that you're using are the best ones because the, the wisdom of the crowds has chosen those uh, components. And then I think really important for us in, in building a company is open source really allowed us to attract incredible talent uh, in, develop, in the development community. And it's really uh, the best developers uh, love to have their work on display and have it freely used and, and have an impact in the world uh, by having you know, thousands of people use their, their code. And so we've been able to, I think in WSO2, have an incredible talent pool. So um, another aspect of why open source is still important, and notice I don't have the word free up here. I don't actually like to talk about free as much. I think it's more interesting to get down into the details of what that means. Um, you know, there's a whole aspect of cost and even equity. Um, I think Sanjeeva mentioned this too uh, in his keynote that software is a necessary part of our society now. If you're running a government and you have citizens, you really need software to provide them good services. And um, it's, it's an important you know, right that, that uh, nations have to, to serve their citizens better, it's a necessary component, and that shouldn't be gated by high costs or, um, or uh, you know, intellectual property regimes. Uh, there, if there are nations, for instance, that are economically challenged, it's nice to, for them to have opportunities to, to deploy great software. Um, I think we used to talk a lot about um, vendor lock-in. Uh, with open source back 20 years ago when we were really looking at some of the large companies with very restricted licenses and, and um, relationships that weren't that good. And you know, Oracle was kind of a poster child for that. So many of our initial customers said, we're using Oracle today, we want to try open source. That's really how we got a, our start in, in the business. Um, but uh, even today, I think it's even, even higher uh, or more important uh, to Consider, you know, where your your vendor is coming from. Are they, you know, in a, are they located in a, quote unquote, hostile state? You know, are there uh, uh, regimes uh, that or regulations in those states that make it uh, bring you concern? And um, I think we also have seen that open source gives you puts a lot of pressure on the whole ecosystem to keep costs of software reasonable. Um, you know, when you have a, a, an intellectual property regime that says this is the only, I have protection over, over this uh, mechanism, you can charge monopoly rates, and that's really not that good for the world. So uh, one of the things that really drives WSO2 is this ideological reason that software should be for everybody. It's a public good, and it helps human progress. And, um, and I think this is important for the world. It's, it's something that I think we all benefit from as citizens and as, of course, software consumers. We talk, we see a lot more importance, actually, over the last three or four years uh, of software independence. 
you know, the geopolitical uh, system has, um, has really made it harder. Uh, it's kind of uh, depressed globalization. It's harder to work with companies across the world. There may be regulations. There may be sanctions uh, in, in the government. So, you know, we, we used to talk a lot about vendor lock-in. We don't really uh, talk about that any longer. Um, vendor lock-in kind of uh, went, went away. You know, the pressure of open source caused even the uh, proprietary vendors to open things up to have more reasonable prices and more uh, standard uh, licensing terms. And even if you're using an open source solution, you're kind of locked into that with the expertise that you have, have gained uh, to some extent. So vendor lock-in isn't really something that's important to, to users as much as now governments uh, are a more important factor, which is why we're using the term software independence. For instance, we had quite a nice business in Russia, had a bunch of, of, uh, of customers there, and then you know, sanctions came up, and we could no longer do business there as a US corporation. Well, um, so you know, we lost that revenue, we terminated those, those contracts, of course, as required by law. But all those users, they still had access to the open source, they could downgrade, they could continue to, to run the necessary things they, they needed to, to keep their society functioning. So um, there's, the, uh, there's a lot of concerns these days about China. You know, are, if you are using a Chinese product like TikTok, are the, is the Chinese government imposing some secret rules and snooping on citizens' data in other countries? You, we don't re really know. So these, when you're concerned about these things, open source really gives you an escape valve. If the worst happens, you still have control over the code, you can see the code, you know what's in there, you can control your data, you have independence from the, from the, um, the political winds, the geopolitical fortunes that might come up. So our open source policies really haven't changed, but it, it's worth uh, you know, re reiterating um, and putting it into some structure, you know, especially as we, uh, we uh, offer SaaS products as well. Our policy has always been the same. All of our download uh, all of our downloadable products are uh, open source. We don't uh, have um, any features that are not uh, also open source, like a dual licensing where you get a community version, but if you really want to use it in an enterprise, you need some, some additional functionality which is not open source. We still have a commitment that everything that you can download from us is, is open source. Um, we do provide uh, critical security releases on the latest release to the community. So um, if there is a, a critical issue that uh, is of concern, uh, you can also get that. We don't provide all of the uh, bug fixes to the community release or non-critical security things, but if there is something that is concern, of concern to the, uh, to the industry, we do uh, make that available. We develop still under the, an open process uh, the Apache way, that means if you want, to, when we hire a new person in WSO2, we say, we want you to work on this product. They don't even have commit rights uh, to that product until they earn it. They can start committing, they can, they, they can uh, uh, you know, post suggestions, <laughs> but until the other developers who are part of the committership of that project agree that they have earned the right to be a committer, then they're allowed in. And we still have many committers on our projects of people who have left WSO2 or external people that, that have uh, joined the project to help, help commit. So um, even though WSO2 sponsors it and really drives the, the evolution and provides most of the manpower for the open source uh, projects, there are, uh, it is open and you can come and say, this you know, release should not go out because there's, there's a flaw. And anybody who's in the community can, can help with that. And we always uh, still use the uh, permissive licenses, uh, at Apache 2 and, and compatible, which uh, is a copy, it's not a copy left uh, license, so there's uh, fewer concerns about whether it will influence your choices in the future on how you may want to distribute software. So th this has really been in place since the start of WSO2 and it really hasn't changed. I think we're, we haven't talked about it as much recently, and I think that was a mistake. I think we, uh, we're trying to rectify that now and, and say, look, this is who we are. It's fundamental. And if, you have, if there's new people coming to the WSO2 ecosystem, we want them to understand this. So you know, why have we chosen open source as, as a model? And you know, fundamentally, it's Sanjeeva. Sanjeeva really uh, deeply believes this and has built it into the fundamental structure and, and 
uh, culture and ethos of the company. So I don't want to say it's, you know, uh, it's, it's something that, that we came to independently. It's really an idle, it makes us a mission-driven uh, company, which is good for employee retention and motivation and all of those things. But it is a, uh, we do admit that it's a uh, ideolo ideological decision. I think one of the things we're really proud of is the increased equity that it brings to employees. So for instance, if you're a software developer and you work for a company and you leave to another job and they say, hey, well, can you show me some code that you've written? And the answer is no, it's all locked up in that previous company. You can never use it again or see it again. You probably shouldn't even take a copy with you when you leave the company. Open source, all that is available. You can show it to a prospective employer. You can continue to work on it, continue to use it for your personal use or even for a commercial use as you go forward. And it gives you exposure on the world stage within that community. So uh, we're really proud of many of our you know, developers. A lot of our uh, folks who were former WSO2 people got their start in open source, got exposed to the, the world stage and, and leveraged that into very exciting careers with some of the most respected uh, tech companies in the world. And, and I think coming in as an open source developer provides a good foundation for that career development for the employees. And you know, one of the, another reason we chose it is because we, our development center is in Sri Lanka. Um, it's not in Silicon Valley or in uh, one of the other hotspots. You know, there's lots of places that pop up like Silicon Alley. One of my favorite is uh, in Chile, their startup program to attract tech, it's called Chilean Valley, which is pretty funny. But there's lots of little hot spots. But with open source, we don't care where you are. You can be, as long as you have internet, you are a, can be a full member of the community. And it really helped us um, you know, level the playing field kind of geographically. So opportunities, no matter where you are in the world. And you know, we do, uh, our business model does benefit from some of the unique advantages that open source uh, provides. You know, one is, especially when we were starting, the competitors are IBM and Oracle. What's their marketing budget? You know, massive. Here we are, a startup. Our marketing budget is zero. How can we get any awareness? How can we get people attracted to us? Well, open source provided us a brand and some awareness that would, uh, you know, allow people to come and check us out and see if our product was better. So, better product and open source attracted uh, a customer. So, um, if we've done a lot of of uh, different marketing uh, initiatives in the past, and the ones that work best are ones that are more, uh, more uh, oriented towards community. This conference is about people meeting people and, and word of mouth spreading, hearing the stories that we have. Just you know, spending a lot of money on, on advertising uh, hasn't really worked for us. So I think the, the marketing, uh, the word of mouth is one of the most powerful marketing uh, aspects and open source really is completely in line and, and supports that. Um, there are lots of organizations and especially governments that have either a requirement or a preference for open source. So it helps us appear in, in consideration for those opportunities. And I think we, no matter uh, what we're actually charging, we have an expectation that open source today is going to be high value and, and lower cost than, than the alternatives. Because honestly, you can always use it for free if, if, if you want to. So our business model is, it's a challenge then to give away a product free. When I joined from Microsoft, I really didn't understand how Sanjeeva expected to make a business out of that by spending all, I mean, we spend, we have hundreds of developers working diligently and then we give that away for free. How can we make it, make it work? And it, the basis of our business model is pretty simple. We have uh, a lot of users and then we have customers. Users, uh, we can serve by broadcasting. If we post a download, you know, if we get 100 downloads or 1,000 downloads, it doesn't cost us anything extra. It's, when we put something out, uh, it takes no extra effort to serve a large community from a small community. It's, it's public. We rely on the community to help support each other and, and, and build resources around that. And on the other side, we have customers which is those that we, we, have, we spend time with you. It's basically when we have an individual relationship with you, when we provide you expertise, when we actually have a private channel instead of a broadcast public channel to talk about your particular issue. Um, these are things that actually cost us to, every time we have a new customer, it costs us more. 
as opposed to every time we get a new download, it costs us nothing. This is where we charge money, and it scales well because you know when we have uh, customers come in, um, we have costs, but we also make some profit there, and that funds the entire cycle. So um, the difference between you know what a free user gets and a customer, you know, we have uh, community releases. Uh, which are open source and, and free. They're regular, and that's the way you get new bugs and features, is you wait for the next release. Um, if you, there is a critical security update, then we make that available, but it's, it's only the critical ones, and it's only on, on the, the latest release. And there are, you know, Stack Overflow is a great place to get uh, some community insight and some support. We do participate in some Discord channels and stuff, but, you know, we, it's, it's best effort uh, and you can really uh, leverage your own expertise uh, to deploy and use the software or the expertise in the community. Our customers, you know, we have supported distributions, which are fully supported with support accounts. You report an issue, we can, if it is an issue in the product, we can get you a, a patch to that. We, it's not just the latest release, but you can keep that release in place for at least three years and, and we'll support it so you don't have to upgrade every time a new uh, release comes out. Um, of course, we have private security bulletins. If there is a security thing, we tell our customers first. We're going to give them a patch before it becomes public so they can patch it in advance. And uh, of course, uh, an SLA on our support system so you guaranteed responses and resolutions uh, when you have an issue. And all that comes down to you know, working with us from your solution architect and your, and your uh, uh, account management team through to the support team and the customer success folks. We're with you every step of the way. So that's kind of how we've, we've you know, there's gonna be a lot more users on, in, in the free side, but there's enough here that, that are using us in critical situations that need this kind of support to uh, fund our business. All right, so that's the, None of that has really changed, but let's talk a little bit about some of the new challenges that have, have uh, come up recently around open source. Uh, and one of the most exciting ones, I think, uh, is the XZ story. You may, some of you may have uh, heard about this. Uh, there's a little link here, one of the it's kind of simplest overview articles that I, that I enjoyed. And you know, what happened is that, uh, there's, you know, in the Linux stack, there's lots of components. Some of them are pretty low level. Some of them have been around for years. They still need maintenance. Um, there was, uh, XZ is part of a, a compression library. Um, it was maintained by a volunteer. He was a little overworked. There weren't very many people helping him out. And uh, some, you know, nice guys came along and started contributing to the project. Uh, and eventually, after a, you know, several months of productive contributions, he, he granted them commit rights uh, to, to help out. Well, then it turned out these guys weren't just helpful open source developers. It looks like they were nation state backed. And uh, after they kind of took over the project, they in, inserted a very significant backdoor that could affect your SSH. Uh, so it could actually allow you to really compromise a, a system. And, uh, so it's a challenge to have volunteers and a very decentralized uh, development model. There's no authority on top that says, you know, no, you shouldn't let that guy in or even check his credentials. It's, it's decisions made at the bottom. How do we know that those are all secure? It's, it put a lot of worry into people's uh, heads. At the same time, an alert developer who was working at Microsoft noticed that his boot times were getting longer and went and deeply investigated. He could see all the open source. He could, he could trace all the way down, and he discovered that this backdoor had been put in. So because it was open, it was op because it was open decentralized, uh, uh, a hack got inserted. Because it was open, it was able to be detected pretty quickly. But you know, so great, end of story, everything's fine. Well, I think people are still worried now that we found this one. Are there others we haven't found? How do we know? Who's actually checking the code? Without a, a decentralized system, it's hard to enforce those, those kinds of, of standards. Uh, so, you know, I don't have an answer for that. I think it's a concern that we need to be uh, vigilant, vigilant for. And I think that's gonna have the impa impact on how both users and producers and governments and societies are look at open source in the future. I think SaaS has been a huge 
uh, challenge to open source. When we started out, we had a great story. There was a, uh, a prospect who uh, wanted to uh, install an ESB. So he started downloading, I think it was the IBM one, and it was a large download. And so in those days, it was going to take him an hour. So while he was waiting for the download, he downloaded RSB and got his prototype working before the download even, even uh, completed. Uh, so the ease of use, he didn't have to check with his legal team. He didn't have to sign an agreement. It was open source. It was lightweight. He could just, he could, the ease of access and the ease of getting going was absolutely phenomenal. And he chose us going forward because, because of that. Well, SAS has really challenged that because you don't even have to download anything. You just go up and put in your email address and, and you, get a, you can start using something, get a free trial on, on SAS. So the kind of immediacy of execution. Also, I can run something on a SAS system I couldn't really run on my laptop, right? So I have access to more powerful uh, software through SAS than I might as just a, a regular dev. So. Um, it's, it's actually quite attractive. And then anybody who has run, uh, even WSO2, one of the biggest headaches people face is, hey, you need to install your patches. Or, yes, it's been three years, you, need to, you really should upgrade to the latest version because you get new features and uh, all of that. So uh, with SAS, you don't worry about that. They just said, hey, we're gonna, version two is coming out and it'll happen next week and it just happens and you don't have to worry about it. So the ease of use and ease of maintenance of SAS are a competitive threat to the ease of use uh, and ease of acquisition of, of open source in a lot of ways. So if, if you look at the, uh, you know, the software industry, clearly SAS has, has eaten a lot of it. But it, you know, it turns out on-premise software still continues to grow. It's not diminishing. Um, there actually are a lot of, maybe we're a little past the top of the SaaS hype cycle. We're seeing a lot of uh, efforts to reshore things, both for the software independence aspect, but also because SaaS, uh, you know, you're kind of locked into a vendor again and the cost can, can balloon significantly and there's a lot of uh, analysis going on to say, look, if we bring this back into our own data center for this process or that process, can we save money? And, and uh, I think that's going on. I think another uh, thing that's really helping is Kubernetes, right? Now we have the kind of scalability, reliability, the ease of management that, of a cloud native system that really works and is a standard across the industry. And you don't, if you want that cloud native characteristics, you no longer ha have SaaS as your only option. You can actually develop Almost everybody now can develop their own cloud native technologies. You don't have to be a big guy to get that. And um, uh, I think you know there are different uh, regional preferences, and especially data privacy laws. Which you know you may say, look, I'd love to use SaaS, but I can't put my personal information of, of my user base into your data center in you know country X because that's not allowed by my government. I need to have that data on, in my uh, country physically or, or something. So there are, th those only seem to grow. There's more and more data privacy regulations and things like that. So there's, the concerns only grow. So I think there are, um, uh, even though SAS is, has been cannibalizing a lot of opportunities from downloadable open source, I think uh, there's still plenty of, of room, uh, plenty of concerns that drive the adoption of on-premises software. I think another challenge uh, that continues, it started you know, several years ago, is the worry about software from software vendors that are worried about the clouds coming in and, and competing them out of, out of business. And especially for a lot of the database, open source databases, uh, Mongo, Maria, and some of these others, um, they were very concerned, and in some cases rightly, <laughs> that Amazon would come in, offer you know, uh, MongoDB as a service with no commercial relationship with, with Mongo. And all of a sudden, a lot of their customers could just go and get it through and pay Amazon, and Mongo would have diminished opportunities uh, as a result. So uh, those concerns, in some cases, they've been well-founded. In other cases, they're not. I don't think we're too worried about it. We'll, we'll see. You know, we, by having constant innovation, by making sure we have SaaS offerings already available, and in the space we're at, uh, which is highly dynamic and not as kind of static as, as a database, I think we're insulated from this uh, a bit more. Uh, we'll see. But uh, a lot of vendors get spooked, and probably a, their investors also get spooked 
by the possibility that you know one product release from a major uh, cloud vendor could could essentially destroy their growth potential. And so they're moving away from open source licenses. They'll do pure open source licenses. They'll say, hey, look, it's open source unless you know, you're mega cloud or you're, doing, uh, you're delivering this over a network or you're providing this as SaaS. So they'll put in exceptions to the open source to specifically exclude those, those uh, com competing uh, vendors. Uh, so no longer, so trend towards less purity in the license uh, space. And I think um, you know, we have uh, great news this week about uh, changing up our investors, but um, I think the invest investment uh, angle has really been a, a challenge, and we haven't seen, it, it was a challenge for WSO2 to find the right mix of investors who are willing to invest in open source instead of something like SaaS. Uh, the traditional VCs haven't really uh, proliferated our business model. I've been looking around, see if are there any other uh, companies in the last 15 years or something who have emulated w, WSO2's business model. It's pretty rare. It's pretty pretty hard to find them. And I think a lot of it is, um, you know, it's hard to get VCs interested. You're giving away the software for free. You're com kind of competing with yourself on on price. You. Uh, you, you're not, if, even if you're developing IP, when you license it out, you're saying anybody who uses this also has a license to use my IP, so it's hard to develop a monetizable IP. And, um, you know, SaaS gives you not only full control of the user, but also the data that you can monetize and, and learn from in other ways. And so I think investors are pushing uh, away, f or, or they're not pushing for open source. At the best, maybe they'll do li dual licensing where, yeah, you can do some open source, but your business is really driven by this, these enterprise features that, that you're doing, and that's where we're really gonna put the effort and put as least in effort into the community versions you can and put the most effort into the commercially licensed aspects. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there, there are a lot of companies, of course, that, that do open source, but it's not a direct way to, to sell software. It's, it's some, something indirect. For instance, um, a lot of the big companies will put out uh, some technologies open source that's not, maybe it's critical, but not core to their business model in order to, pre to uh, preempt competition in that space or to take out a competitor by undercutting cutting them. Uh, a lot of times it's there to boost the reputation or to lower your overall maintenance cost. So I think when you see like the big vendors put out open source, it's not because uh, they want to build a business around that open source, it's because they're getting indirect benefits or they're harming the competition in some way, or they're just bringing in the community to lower their innovation and maintenance costs on some fundamental in infrastructure. I think one of the other challenges I've been looking at and thinking on and uh, still trying to get my head around uh, is the increased regulation in the software space. Um, the two of the, one, the developments that are most prominent in my mind are the U.S. Cyber Trust Mark Act, which is, um, which is kind of interesting, I think useful, where there's kind of a checklist uh, you can go through and say, look, this is open source, but it is uh, somebody in this case, maybe a, th a third-party uh, lab uh, has validated that you know this meets the the security requirements uh, that that you that are standard uh, for you to uh, adopt it. The European Cyber Resiliency Act goes the other way, which says um, insecure software is a problem of the creator, and therefore they should be liable for product defects in that, such as you know hackability or you know not ha being able to update. Uh, to process security updates. If you can't handle security updates, your product should be deemed as unsafe and you should not uh, market it in, uh, in Europe and you should be subject to, to fines if, uh, if you do. Well, open source, and there, it's covering open source as well. So, you know, anybody who, any company that does business in Europe and releases something as open source now is, is accepting new liability for um, for making sure that the release has been documented, that it's, it's uh, met a checklist of good uh, development practices. And um, it's, it actually has global effect because we, if you release something open source, 
You can't say this is open source and here's how it's worked in Europe and here's where it works everywhere else. It kind of, uh, the effects of this can bleed over into the rest of the world. So, um, you know, for the vendors, software vendors uh, like us, it's a real challenge. You know, we're giving open source away for free, yet in order to do that, we're now accepting new liabilities and, and requirements and increased costs of, of delivering that. How do we square those two things? You know, how do we fund, if we're giving away for free, how do we fund these, these new uh, responsibilities and liabilities? Uh, we have to now meet certain checklists. We have to document everything before we can release something. Uh, we have to uh, provide uh, security updates. Uh, right now, we just do the critical ones for our open source users. Now we have to do every single one. Even if it's a very, very minor potential vulnerability, we have to make that available. So it means we have to spend a lot more time now uh, working on the free side and put a lot more investment on something which before we could do in a very scalable way because we'd publish it once and people would consume it pretty much as is. Um, we have to commit to a product life, lifetime. This is a whole new concept in open source. You put it out there and how, what's the product lifetime of that? There is no product lifetime. It's there, you use it as long as you want. And it, if it's 100 years and you're still using it, fine. But there's no such concept as a product life, lifetime because you know, if there's a new version, it'll have it. You can move to that. It's, it's, uh, it's very, it's putting a, a whole new mindset around open, releasing open source software. And maybe I have a very American perspective, but this seems, you know, like overreach uh, on, on the product side. And to, to say, you know, uh, it's entirely the, uh, the producer's fault. Uh, if there's a security vulnerability, rather than it's a shared responsibility of the consumer and the producer. There's a lot of open source software out there. Even with this regulation, there's gonna be a lot of open source software out there that may be not as secure as, as you like. It's, it, it's your responsibility as a consumer to work with the community and investigate yourself to make sure you're using software that, that meets your security requirements. And it's not only vendors who are responsible for this. Um, you know, who pays for, for this? Well, in the end, um, it's going to raise the cost of open source for everybody. So a few predictions. I can't tell. Am I out of t already out of time? Or what time is it? Okay, I'll wrap up very quickly. Sorry, I'm running over. I think there's a, we're going to see a time of push and pull on the open source. There's, uh, you know, there's a lot more demand for open source that's been, been driven by the globalization, by looking at reshoring, the marketing. I think these are all things that are gonna pu push open source more uh, uh, quickly. But then these regulatory uh, challenges, um, the lack of, you know, we have a public good, but there's no public funding uh, for that public good are going to make it harder to uh, adopt. Um, a couple of interesting ideas on how we treat it as an open, open uh, public good, one is, uh, this new idea from Tim Bray on open source quality institutes, I was thinking this as well. Maybe if, if software is a public good, maybe there needs to be some public funding for people to look at the low, low level um, code and make sure it's secure. And you know, I think we need to recognize that every time a developer is, wants to release software, and with the CRA and specifically, they now need to make, make, consider that carefully. Are they going to accept the responsibility? If we, for instance, have an intern who writes out some code and, and they release it as open source, are we now on the hook? Should we go ahead and fully conform and accept that we will maintain some internship project code as open source? Should we not release it at all? Should we release as closed source? You know, wh what is it that we, that we should do to make sure that we can, we can do that? I think overall, this is going to depress the, uh, the, um, the open source the ecosystem of open source, especially low level and experimental open source that, that's out there. I think we should get used to less license purity. You know, we have tried to maintain a very high standard of using very pure Apache licenses. As users, I would say, look, there's a lot of things that are close enough to open source for your purposes, even though they help address some of the problems with competing with SaaS and, and, uh, and helping address some of the uh, regulatory burdens. I think. Again, pooling resources through cloud, uh, open source foundations is going to rise again because it's going to help people manage the process of, of conforming. So, you know, 
What can I recommend personally? I think you know, we need to, to be aware that open source is under challenge. As a society, we should be willing to support it. Um, I think as a practical matter, you may have to look and see which kinds of open source licenses uh, or open source adjacent licenses are acceptable to you. And that, I think that's going to be a fact of, of life. And um, you, know, you have to take some responsibility for the open source that you know. Make sure you look at the software bill of materials. We have that in each of our products to know what's in it, what are, what are the potential risks. And um, I think we'll see, you know, oh, it's going to be a, more, a little more challenging to keep our open source community vibrant, but it's clearly still going to be an important factor in all of our businesses going forward. So thank you.